those of you who tweet, there's a, a hashtag for the conference, Arentcon. Uh, you're welcome to use that. Um, also, I just want to make one or two quick announcements. Uh, at, at, uh, at about 1.10 or 1.15, for those of you who signed up for the first walk and visit to the Hannah Arendt Center gravesite, uh, we will meet uh, just to the left of the registration desk on the door, at the door that goes out the, out the auditorium that way at about 1.15. And we can take our lunch and go and visit the gravesite and talk a little bit about Hannah Arendt for those who signed up for that or who want to come. And uh, we will have a series of breakout sessions during lunch. These are smaller groups, informal, where you can uh, talk to some of the speakers uh, and continue the conversation. Um, uh, I'll, t I'll mention those again at the end of this session. But the uh, last thing is, if those, anyone who needs a hearing impaired device where you have, uh, uh, where it helps you to hear the speakers, we have those now available at the, pre -reg at the registration table out front. So if you'd like uh, a device to enable you to hear better, we have those in the f at the registration desk. Um, I think people are gonna start uh, moving in but as they do, I'm going to turn it over now to uh, my friend and colleague, Ken Stern, who's going to introduce our next panel uh, and talk. Thank you very much. Anyway, thank you, Roger. Welcome, everybody. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here today to introduce my good friend and colleague, Eric Ward. Uh, who's going to be speaking about how anti-Semitism animates white nationalism. Before I do, I want to spend a couple of minutes uh, talking about the Bard Center for the Study of Hate because the story of that also uh, intersects with Eric's story and how we know each other. Um, the Bard Center for the Study of the Hate has been around for about a year, but its genesis goes back a couple of decades. Um, there was a colleague and friend of both Eric's and mine named Bill Wasmuth, uh, who Eric actually worked for, I worked with. Uh, he was an amazing person. He was a uh, parish priest in northern Idaho, right near the Aryan Nations compound in its heyday. And he started speaking out about the racism and anti-Semitism uh, that was happening in his community. So his house was firebombed with him in it. And Bill, that just basically pissed him off. Um, so he ended up leaving um, the clergy and starting this group that Eric eventually worked for and then ran called the Northwest Coalition uh, for many years. And I got to um, work with that group when I was for 25 years the director on anti-Semitism and extremism for the American Jewish Committee. And I would go to Bill's conferences, which would rotate around the Pacific Northwest. And a couple of years in, um, he asked me to give a keynote. And I said, Bill, I'm happy to do that, but what do you want me to do? And he said, challenge us to do something we're not already doing. And then it occurred to me that 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 was the group, the Northwest Coalition, that was actually the model I was talking to people in other parts of the country about. They were doing amazing work combating racism and anti-Semitism and homophobia and all sorts of bigotry and hatred. And I said, you know, that's a hard ask. But then I started to think about it. And I started to think that the people that were coming to the conference were people like me from uh, national and regional groups that were dealing with a specific form of, of hatred or from religious communities and from uh, ethnic communities, police forces and others. The academics were coming because they were personally interested. They may be doing some things about hatred, but it wasn't really ingrained in the enterprise of the Northwest Coalition. And there was no connection between what was coming out of the academy and informing groups like the Northwest Coalition or AJC or ADL or any of the others about how do we understand what we're doing when we're programming against hatred. And that was the observation. So Bill said, great idea. Let's go find a place to, to house this. He looked and we looked over the Northwest. Everybody said, great idea. Where's the money? We don't have any. Thank you very much. 
And then what happened, uh, there was a conference that was happening at Gonzaga University in Spokane where the week or two or three before, the three black law students all had death threats. And Gonzaga said, well, what can we do? And Bill said, we have an idea. So that started the first hate studies center at Gonzaga, which still continues, and it does two things very well. It has a conference every two years, and I brought Bard students uh, last year, and the next conference we're going to bring some again. And it has a journal that comes out, but it hasn't had the transformative effect on the academy to produce these testable ideas for people that are actually engaging hatred. And that's what we want to do at Bard, and that's what we, we set up um, a year ago. So just very uh, quick notes, and there are flyers outside and posters around the campus. We're bringing in speakers. We have student programs uh, for the high school students. There's a uh, essay contest on, that dovetails on the Kennedy Center's Profile and Courage Awards. So if you write something about a, a politician who has uh, done something courageous against hatred, you could be part of that competition. We're supporting senior projects. We have internships at groups, and I hope we could play somebody with Eric next summer, because that'll be a, an incredible experience working with Eric and his, and his crew. Uh, we have an award for students and faculty and staff called the Beth Rickey Award. How many of you know the name Beth Rickey, other than Eric? I don't see anybody. There was a woman who was a Republican state committee woman who conservative from a patrician family in Louisiana who just could not stand the fact that David Duke, the neo-Nazi former Klansman, called himself a Republican and was running for office. And she outed him and she followed him and she had death threats too uh, and she ended up derailing his political career. So she was somebody who spoke out of, against hatred in her own community. Um, and we have an award in her honor for somebody who does something either academically or activist-wise combating hatred. Faculty at Bard in the last year, it's been incredibly gratifying. We have 40 classes that we've identified that all intersect hate. We have a faculty reading group on hatred that's meeting every three weeks. Uh, we received a grant for new classes, so there are faculty members here. I want to reiterate that we want to really uh, expand the number of classes about hatred, including the interdisciplinary ones. We have a professor who's doing a political index of hatred in different parts of the country. I have an economics professor who is going to run a uh, annual uh, study of the economic cost of hate, which if you think about it, everything we quantify that we want to deal with in society, there's no quantification of the cost of hate. So we're going to produce that out of BARD. Uh, we're going to have a conference on social media and hatred, especially how to use it more effectively, uh, social media against hate, and an academic conference to bring together people that have something to say about how these groups should be fighting hatred uh, with the groups. And I want to, especially for the students, invite you, if you have ideas on any of these uh, projects, we're eager to involve you. And it doesn't have to be on the politics of it, it could be just on the computer science of using social media uh, more effectively. So that's the background to what we're doing here. So let me introduce Eric, who I said I've known for over 30 years. Um, just when I was starting at AJC, it's when Eric and I first intersected. He's originally from LA, um, but he founded and directed a community project to expose and counter hate groups in Eugene, Oregon. And he went on to work with Bill Wasmuth, uh, who I mentioned, at the Northwest Coalition from 1994 to 2002, and then he became the director. Now, Eric's bio says he, quote, worked with government leaders, civil rights campaigners, business leaders, and law enforcement officials to establish over 120 task force in Colorado, Idaho, Montana, Oregon, Washington, Wyoming. That's true. But what I remember most about Eric from that period of time, and you have to imagine I had more hair, he had a hell of a lot more hair, long dreadlocks, and he always managed to walk into white supremacist meetings and then walk out without getting himself killed, partly because he has an engaging smile uh, and also a very humanizing laugh. But he was really in the trenches in the Northwest, in particular, of uh, monitoring a lot of these groups. From 2003 to 2011, he became the national field director of the Center for New Community out of the Chicago area and became one of the leading organizers for immigrant rights and the combating of anti-immigrant hatred. And then he went into philanthropy. He was the first program executive for the Atlantic Philanthropy's U.S. Reconciliation and Human Rights Program from 2011 to 2014. 
and Bard benefited directly from that placement. Some of you recall that uh, there were four network classes at Bard under the auspices of the Hannah Arendt Center in 2014, about eight, one of which the dean taught. And Eric was responsible for the funding that made those courses possible at Bard. Um, uh, and he went on from there to the Ford Foundation and last year returned to the Pacific Northwest, which is greatly benefiting from his presence as the executive director of the Western State Center. And again, from the Northwest doing some of the best work against hatred today. So my good friend, Eric Ward. Good afternoon, everyone. See, I gave, I gave up my comfortable seat. That is a very comfortable chair. Um, but I also realized as I was sitting there uh, that Ken and I are the thing standing between you and lunch. And um, it's a terrible place to be. But I am glad to be here at Bard, and, and thank you, Ken, for inviting me and also those who organized uh, uh, the symposium and conference over the next a couple of days. Look, I, it's interesting. I was red-eyeing here from uh, Los Angeles last night, um, and I was kind of looking through uh, social media, and I figured out that it was, uh, wow, I am, it was 40 years ago uh, this month that I snuck out of my house, um, don't try this at home, um, but snuck out my window and went to my first punk show, um, which was the, the Germs in uh, Orange County. And um, I think about that because it was a great show, um, but it also like shaped my life in really significant ways. So I am a child of, of Los Angeles. I um, grew up there. I am part of four generations of Los Angeles. And my family came to L.A. in the early 1900s. Um, we often don't talk about it in this context, but my family were refugees um, fleeing Shepherdsville, Kentucky. And they were fleeing... Um, for their lives. So my aunt, great, great aunt, was coming around a bend one day, um, and I always think of it as a carriage with horses, but it was likely a cart and a mule. And she came around the bend um, and came across a lynching that was happening uh, in Shepherdsville. This was a story, and then um, about six or seven years ago, I started searching around because I didn't know how true this was, right? Memory is a strange thing and myth is a strange thing. But I did find the story of Marie L. Thompson um, and uh, the lynching of Marie L. Thompson. Marie L. Thompson was a sharecropper and she and her son work, were working uh, a portion of property that was owned uh, by a white man, who one day accused her son of stealing tools and started to beat him. She intervened um, and began to fight this man and ended up killing him. She was arrested and put into jail. Um, and later that night, a lynch mob came um, and they lynched her. The story went on to say, um, the official uh, newspaper story, that somehow um, she was able to use her legs to wrap them around the neck of one of the, the lynch mob persons and was able to pull, somehow pull him towards her and somehow it knocked her off the tree. She grabbed his knife and she held off the lynch mob crew and they ended up killing her by shooting her to death. That was the story in, in the newspaper. Then two years ago, I found another story. The lynching, not of Marie L. Thompson of Shepherdsville, but the story of the lynching of Mary L. Thompson of Shepherdsville, Kentucky. And in this story, Mary L. Thompson actually survived her lynching and died of an old age. 
Both of those stories are a reflection to me that often we perceive we know exactly what is happening. Particularly those of us who are human rights activists and those of us who are in academics. We believe that we actually know what is happening in the world. And we often rely on conventional wisdom rather than research that is needed to understand phenomena. I'll relay this in a different story. And what I'm doing right now is telling you how I came into this work. I'm in the punk rock scene. Eventually, a bunch of friends, uh, we form a band. Uh, that band goes on to be known as uh, Sublime um, in Long Beach, California. Um, some folks may have heard of the band. It's like, you can apply. That's OK. Yeah? So in true Eric fashion, right, um, I, I just decide one day I'm getting out of L.A. And I'm getting out of L.A. because I have two friends who are moving up to Eugene, Oregon. And I want to leave L.A. because I cannot see myself beyond the age of 23, right? And for an 18-year-old, a 19-year-old, 20-year-old, 21-year-old, 22-year-old black males in Los Angeles, that was pretty common. But I wanted to live past my 20s. And I was trying to figure myself out. So I'd like to tell you that my friends were moving up there and I decided to move up, but as I told you, that's not always how stories go. What really happened is my two friends asked me, do you want to move to Eugene, Oregon? They were going to the University of Oregon. And my first response to these two friends who I grew up with and loved and spent a lot of time with was, why in the hell would I ever leave LA? And then why would I leave it and move to Eugene, Oregon? And if you could have ripped open the back of my head and looked in, what you would have seen in my head was San Francisco, a lot of trees, and the Space Needle, which wasn't even in Oregon, right? I had no conception of what Oregon looked like. And because I had no real conception, I never, I had only left LA, Southern California, once in my life, right? And it wasn't to Oregon. So because I didn't have an understanding, I began to fill in the blanks. And the ways that I began to fill in the blanks were by things that I thought I knew. So I knew Little House in the Prairie. And I remember asking my friends, right, did they have electricity in Eugene, Oregon? Did they have running water? Was there McDonald's? Do you think that they had cable and did they have MTV on it? These were real questions that I had. These were stereotypes. As we know, there are rural parts of Oregon, but there are urban parts. There are highways, there's an electrical system. All those things existed. But because I hadn't spent time experiencing it or learning, I filled, in, I filled in with stereotypes. That's often how we both understand race in America. And it is certainly how we have come to understand the white nationalist movement in America today. We think we understand these social movements, but we don't. So one of the things that I want to do today, really quickly, is I want to spend some time talking about white nationalism. And I want to make the argument about why it's important. If you work on issues of immigration, if you work on issues of climate justice, if you work on issues around supporting the rights of the LGBTQ community, if you work on issues around racial justice, policing, and the list goes on, 
you need to understand white nationalism. White nationalism, I believe, is one of the most significant threats to democracy that we have faced from a social movement in decades. And left unchallenged, it can rescript how we understand America. When I talk about white nationalism, what do I mean? Well, I want to talk about it by first talking about something else called white supremacy. America was founded on white supremacy. And what I mean by white supremacy is a system based off of disparity, based off of the idea that some people were superior and some people were inferior based off of skin color. Most of us are familiar with the term. White supremacy was built off of three core pillars. The first was the genocide and stolen resources of native populations. The second was the exploitation of black labor through a system called chattel slavery. And the third, not often acknowledged, was the control of sexuality, primarily women's sexuality. These were the three core pillars of white supremacy. And how it functioned was by convincing people who had lighter skin that they were superior simply because they had lighter skin. Now, it's important for me to say, right? Everyone take a big deep breath, breathe it out. None of us are responsible for that system. None of us were around hundreds of years ago as it was being constructed. But it is part of the society that we live in today. White supremacy and white nationalism are often conflated. We treat them as the same thing. Often, my friends, I reside in the racial justice sphere of the human rights movement, often say to me, we've seen this before, right? This is just the same as the Klan of the 1920s. We have survived this before and we'll survive it again. That's similar to how I thought about Oregon before I went there, right? That is based off of a perception not reality. If white supremacy is a system, white nationalism is a social movement. If white supremacy is built on exploitation, white nationalism seeks the full removal of people of color and Jews from the United States. White supremacy, again, seeks to exploit people of color and women. White nationalism is committed to a form of ethnic cleansing, to create a white-only ethnostate. To conflate white supremacy and white nationalism, I often tell my friends, would be like conflating a Big Mac and a cow because they are both made out of beef. When you drop your Big Mac, you do not call a veterinarian. In the same way, the tools we have developed to challenge white supremacy are not the tools that we need to effectively challenge white nationalism. So if white nationalism is different, where does it come from? Ironically, white nationalism comes from the victory of the civil rights movement. Now, I was in philanthropy, and I spent my time in philanthropy supporting Black Lives Matters and the movement for black lives. And I did it by marching on the streets, supporting leaders, but also raising dollars. One of my favorite shirts that folks used to wear was set on the front, not my mama's civil rights movement. 
Folks may remember that. I love that shirt. I love it in the same way that I love how I used to think about Oregon, right? It's cute. But the honest truth is, that shirt was actually honest. We weren't our mother's civil rights movement. Our mother's civil rights movement was really badass. And they were badass because they had to organize at a time when white supremacy was the actual rule of law. It wasn't contested. It wasn't debated. It was the way things were. People did not wake up wondering if they were superior simply because they were white. The majority of people in this country thought they were superior as white people in the same way that they knew if they breathed, they would breathe out. It was just the way it was. Then comes along the civil rights movement. And the civil rights movement organizes and it defeats Jim Crow in the South. It is actually the largest defeat that white supremacy ever faced. Now, please don't walk out of here saying Eric Ward said white supremacy doesn't exist in America anymore. I can tell you as an African American, it certainly does. And if you talk to folks in the Muslim community, if you talk to immigrants, you talk to other black folks, they will tell you white supremacy still exists. But it's different. It's not the rule of law. It's de facto. And while we don't like to celebrate victories, the civil rights movement was a real victory. So now imagine for a second, you just believe Jim Crow. You believe separate is equal. You don't see it as cruel. It's just the way it is. Black people are inferior. How then do you then explain that you just lost to black people? Not only just lost, but lost the largest political defeat. Do you just all of a sudden say, well, I just I got it wrong, right? Think about your own test that you failed, or maybe, maybe that was just me, Ken. You all probably have never failed a test. One time I failed a test, and I spent a lot of time trying to figure out, how did I fail that test? And the funny thing, the answer is never that I didn't study hard enough. I have lots of reasons why I didn't do well on that test. In the same way, if you believe in Jim Crow, you were never going to accept that black people were equals. So you had to construct another idea. And it was in that construction that anti-Semitism took a new ideological form in America. And it went like this. Arch segregationists decided they didn't lose to black people because that would have been impossible to lose to people who were inferior. So it had to be someone else. And they began to borrow from something they had learned in Europe as World War II veterans and things they had learned from a man by the name of Henry Ford. I don't know if you know Henry Ford, the inventor of the automobile, but what most of us don't know is that Henry Ford was a incredible anti-Semite. So much so that he received one of the highest civilian honors from Nazi Germany. But he also did something else that kind of softened the landscape for anti-Semitism in America as an ideological force. And that is, he came across a book called The Protocols of the Elders of Zion. And the protocols were a forged document, right? Not real, 
that purported to tell the story of a global Jewish conspiracy to destroy European Christendom. And that it started with the idea that a group of Jewish elders met in the cemetery at midnight. I guess that's where all conspiracies are hatched, right? And that this conspiracy was a conspiracy to control the media, to control the economy, to control culture, etc. World War II veterans were exposed to that narrative. And it was a powerful narrative. How powerful? Well, we know during the, lifeline of, of the lifetime of Nazi Europe that the National Socialist Movement at least published over a dozen editions of the protocol. The protocol for a while, right, in the early 2000s, was one of the most popular books on Amazon, right? It was a powerful narrative. If you haven't read it, you all probably know the narrative. And let me give you an example. Anyone ever watched or heard of the X-Files? Raise your hand. It's a lot. Look up, hold your hands up. I, I watched the X-Files a lot. I was, look around the room. Keep your hand up. Don't be shy. This is one thing we can do. Look around the room, see how many hands are up in this room. So, the X-Files, and again, caveat, please don't walk out of here saying, Eric Ward said the X-Files are anti-Semitic. Uh, I'll let the, the folks who are doing cultural studies figure that out. So, the X-Files is a story, a very popular TV show. It's one of the most watched, right, in the early 2000s and late 90s, early 2000s. And the story is this, that there's an FBI agent who thinks that there is a conspiracy. And the conspiracy are aliens who have infiltrated all aspects of society. Economic, government, etc. And they are slowly trying to take over the world and infuse humans with an alien blood, right? That is the plot line of the X-Files. And if you read the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, that is, the pro that is also the plot line. The X-Files was popular because that narrative is very compelling. It makes a complex world very simple, right? And if you don't think the world is complex, as I used to say, take a trip to the store and try to find a toothbrush or a toothpaste, right? I can find myself sitting in the aisle for like 25 minutes trying to figure out which toothpaste I can get. Right? And really, all I want is just some toothpaste. Right? Anti Semitism simplifies what is complex. And it simplifies by scapegoating a marginalized and vulnerable community. And we don't see that community as vulnerable and marginalized. In fact, Anti-Semitism takes the Jewish community and endows it with almost a supernatural attributes. This is what seeped into the segregationist movement in the post-civil rights movement. And the answer was, they didn't lose to black people. They lost to this Jewish conspiracy. And that became the answer to when immigrants began to advocate for their own rights, when Muslims began to advocate for their own rights, when women began to advocate for their own rights. It was never that these marginalized and vulnerable communities were exerting their own agency. 
It was merely that they were puppets of a larger conspiracy. So the one thing I want folks to take away from this, from this conversation is that it is likely in the United States that anti-Semitism may be more of a threat to communities of color, to the LGBTQ community, than the actual Jewish community itself. Anti-Semitism strikes at the heart of democratic practice. Democracy is hard. Democracy is challenging. And the white nationalist movement has organized in very significant ways to undercut it. Now, is everyone in the white nationalist movement a hardcore anti-Semite? Probably not. It is likely that a large percentage have never even heard this conspiracy theory. You would have to go back to the core of white nationalist theorists, like William Pierce of the National Alliance, right? To the pages of Spotlight Magazine and the Liberty Lobby of Willis Carto. Tom Metzger of White Aryan Resistance. It is how I came to understand the importance of anti-Semitism and white nationalism. I'm not here today to tell you that the white nationalist movement is a threat. If you have not understood that after Pittsburgh, South Carolina, Charlottesville, El Paso, Poway, Gilroy, and the other dozens of hate crimes and murders that have happened in the United States, there is nothing that I can say today that will convince you otherwise. But I will share this about why it's important. And I want to go back to David Duke. David Duke, former Klansman, I don't know, Cyclops, Titan, something, clown. Visible Empire, right? Ninth of the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, ran as a Democrat. I like to be clear. Didn't just run as a Republican, right? Ran as a Democrat, ran as a Republican, ran as an Independent. Ran so much, so I'm not going to get into details. But when he first started running, well, the first time he ran for all people were out. They could not believe that David Duke, a former Klansman, had the gall to run for political office. It was the 80s, right? And... Um, people mobilized and they marched and I think David Duke lost that and then he turned around and ran again a second time. People were outraged. Then he turned around and he ran again and people were outraged but he won his seat in Louisiana state legislator, got a standing ovation when he was sworn in. Then he, again he ran for governor of Louisiana and he lost the race for the governorship of Louisiana, the gubernatorial race there. Um, but what we often don't talk about is that David Duke in the 90s won the majority of the white vote in Louisiana when he ran for governor. Meaning that if people of color couldn't vote, right, which had been new, remember, this is the 90s, and black folks had only gotten the vote, right, and other folks of color, right, 1968, 1969, it wasn't that long. But if that had happened, David Duke would have been the governor of Louisiana. And that freaked people out. And I remember, right, folks, how did that happen? So we do what we do in the human rights movement when we panic. We like to go do a lot of polling and focus groups, right? And um, the answer probably someone could have told us over a cup of coffee was, was this. That what happened, frankly, was that David Duke had just bombarded the public for so long uh, with his ideas that they no longer seem so extreme or out there, right? And I liken it to fashion shows. I used to tell this story. I used to love the Fashion Minute on CNN when it first started. I was fascinated by this news that repeated itself and this Fashion Minute, and they would go to London and Rio de Janeiro and Tokyo, and they'd show off the latest fashions. And I had this love-hate thing. And you may have watched fashion shows on the news or other, and you may do this too. I love watching these fashions come down the runway. 
They're so extreme. They're so way out there. And I like saying, oh, my God, I hate that. Who's going to wear that? No one's going to wear that. So out there. And I remember in the 90s seeing 70s fashions come back down the runway and thinking, oh, my God, they've gone too far this time. 70s once was enough for everyone. And by the 90s, 70s fashions were back in style, right? The little, I mean, Walmart still uses the yellow happy face running around slashing prices. Yeah, right. And, um, and that 70s show is still in circulation. In the same way that the fashion industry seeks to influence what happens in the cultural mainstream, so too is the white nationalist movement sought to influence what has happened in the political mainstream. And like all social movements, right, they can be effective. The second thing I want people to understand beyond the mainstreaming is two, social movements have agency. And those of us in the human rights movement are very arrogant. We think we are the only ones who can affect change in society, that we are the only social movements worth paying attention to, right? And I'm, f I'm finishing up here. The truth is, is that all social movements can affect society. They can shift the terrain upon which we understand issues. And if you don't believe this, I always ask folks, when was the last time we had a serious conversation in this country on the environment and on universal health care and access? And who was the president that championed those two things along with ending racial discrimination in employment? Nope. Wasn't Obama. Nope. It was not Clinton. It was Richard Nixon, right? Society and social movements shift. And it is why we need to be vigilant around the white nationalist movement today. To understand this movement, though, means we need to understand anti-Semitism and the role that it plays. It is not merely one of the items on the laundry list of white nationalism, it is the paper upon which white nationalism is written. If we are to defeat white nationalism and open up the political space once again to advocate against Islamophobia, against xenophobia, against anti-black racism, we need to defeat the narrative of white nationalism. This is why anti-Semitism is important. It is why in the academy, professors and students need to take anti-Semitism seriously and to understand the ideological role, not behavior, but the ideological role that it plays in America today. That is the task before us, and I hope that is the conversation we have right now. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. I'm always so pleased when students and others can hear you, and it's been a pleasure for me for Thank three you. decades. I have one quick observation, one question, and then I want to open it up, particularly for students. So the observation is when I speak to Jewish audiences who are predominantly concerned about anti-Semitism, what I say to them is based on the same theory, but it's exactly the opposite. I said, don't worry about what people are gonna say about Jews. If you're really worried about anti-Semitism, worry about the anti-Muslim, the anti-immigrant, the anti-Hispanic, 
um, that that cultivates the environment in which anti-Semitism is likely to grow. And we saw that in Pittsburgh. You had a shooter, Bowers, who was apparently driven by concern about all these invaders coming from the south. And he wasn't going after Ecuadorians or Guatemalans, but for, for the precisely the reasons that you talked about, he went after Jews. So if you want to tamp it down, you have to not only be concerned about anti-Semitism, but the other things. But the question I want to ask you is, is this. Again, we've known each other a long time, and I think from the early 90s, and as I recall, some of the conversations that you and I and people like Lenny Zeskin and others were having, you know, go back to 1992. So what was the worry? You had Pat Buchanan. I presume the younger folks here don't know who Pat Buchanan was, but he was, again, somebody who worked with Nixon. He was a, a pundit on, on TV and radio and so forth. Um, and he was promoting the same sorts of fears that we see coming out of Trump, talking about America becoming a majority non-white society in 2050. Unlike Trump, he read books, he wrote books, he could string a sentence together, and he was palpably playing into these fears. He was also talking about America first from the 30s and revitalizing that before Trump. So, you know, we were all concerned in 92, 96. It didn't quite happen the way that we were fearing, and then, you know, we see Trump, okay? And all of us were looking, well, I don't know, you and I were talking and some others, we thought, okay, Trump's gonna lose, then what's gonna happen? And we, and, well, you thought he was gonna win, you were, right. So, but, you know, if he had lost, the fear was, among many, that you'd see a split. There'd be some folks talking about how do we organize the Republican Party better, like Goldwater, after Goldwater in 64, and there'd be those folks who would go the militia route that are fueled by conspiracy theories and have a lot of guns and bombs and so forth. And that didn't happen, but now we're at a point which really worries me, and this is what I'd like to get your, your um, reflections on. We have a president who plays into conspiracy theories and plays into xenophobia and racism and so forth. Um, if the impeachment process goes forward, and let's just say, you know, uh, he basically says, I'm not leaving. This is the deep state. It's gotten some of my Republican colleagues to come over the deep state. I'm not going, and you have to defend it because this is a coup. Where do you think we'll be in terms of anti-Semitism and white nationalism? Well, I, so where I think we are with, with white nationalism um, so I'll share a story. So I think I can share this story. Um, s someone who, uh, uh, so a person who's close to David Duke, right, who's now, you know, he's elder, right? Um, someone asked him uh, earlier this year, how is he feeling, right? So remember, this is one of the main strategists, right? And we know Right, one of the reasons that white nationalism has taken root in Eastern Europe had a lot to do with David Duke's work, right? Um, and so someone here asked him, What's, how are you feeling? And David Duke's response was, I'm great. I never thought we would be here in my lifetime, right? And I never thought in my lifetime this could happen, right? So the main, one of the main theorists of the white nationalist movement thinks that it is actually possible. And if you look at other places in the world right now where um, racial nationalism, right, is driving politics, it is possibly right. And so I'm not an American exceptionalist, right? I'm definitely an American. There are things that I love about the United States that are unique not special, right? Um, but even we buy into the American exceptionalism. We think somehow our democracy, right, is safer than any other democracy in the world, and that's a threat. My take is the white nationalist movement in the last electoral cycle had over 300 individuals running for public office from local to national, right? In previous electoral cycles, the most ever tracked was like 40, right? So that tells me, along with the rise of white nationalist violence, 
that they have reached a stage of social movement maturity where they can express themselves both electorally, right, and through violence to create intimidation, right, and doubt around a democratic system. I know people are excited about the impeachment. Like, I don't want to take, I've, I, I'm not excited about the impeachment. I think we have to follow the rule of law because the rule of law is important in this country. But none of us should be naive about the constitutional crisis that we have just entered into. And if we think anti-Semitism is bad now, wait until a moment where Trump is thrown out of office or loses the next election and the white nationalist of his base start blaming folks like Miller, right? And Ivanka, right? Um, the idea of almost like a Dreyfus, right? That there was a traitor within their midst. And so I think we will see a hardening of ideological anti-Semitism. But what's frightening, Ken, is that as a human rights movement, we are not equipped to respond to anti-Semitism. We refuse to accept that it even exists. We are stuck on racial binary. We think it o racism only works based off of skin color. And so we have taken ourselves out of that game and that fight right now. And that's even more frightening. Thank you, Eric. Let me get some questions from some students in particular. Yeah. Is there a, is there a microphone that's coming to you shortly? So wait for it so everybody can hear you. Oh. Okay, um, great, hi, great, great my name's Maddie. I just um, basically wanted to ask, so it seems like anti-Semitism and conspiracy theories is kind of a, um, a be-all, end-all cover answer to, I think, a lot of questions and a lot of um, responses that people may have to um, the kind of <laughs> white nationalism movement. Um, so how do you think that America can start to um, heal, in a sense, and start to have a conversation about white nationalism and with white nationalists that can kind of reverse or stop, in a way, this kind of path that we're going down? Yeah. Uh, so one is, is the non-Jewish community and, you know, needs to start having a conversation around anti-Semitism. Non-Jews, or and sorry, and the Jewish community needs to start having a conversation about white supremacy, right? And let me tell you what, if we really want to get to the core of this. So I was at a demonstration, folks may remember the Proud Boys and some of the alt-right demonstrations. We have a lot of them in Portland, Oregon, right? And, um, there was one two summers ago outside of a blues festival, right? They're really smart about when they plan their marches for maximum media coverage, right? And there was this one white nationalist or alt-right, I don't know which one he, I don't know if he was a hardcore white nationalist, so I don't want to say that. And he was being interviewed by some cameraman, and the cameraman was like, giving a hard time, why are you here, right? No one wants you in Portland, which was true, the majority of Portland doesn't want them. And, you know, the mayor doesn't want you, these counter-protesters don't want you, why are you here? And that young white nationalist kid said to the cameraman, yeah, you can, s I've heard this, and you can say you don't want us here, but the fact of the matter is, is Portland, Oregon, is one of the few urban cities in America that whose black population is shrinking by both percentage and whole number. And he said to the cameraman, basically, you are doing something we could never get away with. You are disappearing the black population of Portland, Oregon. So yeah, you can say you don't want us here, but that's BS, right? That is why we have to take white supremacy, the vestiges of white supremacy seriously in America. Our inability to tackle white supremacy, right? The treatment of Muslims, the treatment of immigrants and refugees, the treatment of black folks, 
Asians, right? Poor white folks, right? Who also suffer from racism, but in a different way, right? Um, what it does is it makes us look like the alternative to white nationalism is hypocrisy. And that is not an effective response to a social movement who is claiming a new vision of America. So what I would tell young folks really quickly is I used to play this game when we were kids. We were poor. We didn't have a lot of money by August. Right? We'd been out of school for three months. We literally had nothing to do. So eventually, you'd find us sitting in a circle somewhere playing a game, If I Were. And If I Were went like this. If I were in a lion's cage and the lion came in, here's how I would get out. Right? Or if I was driving down the freeway and the brakes went out, here's what I would do. The one that always came up was if I were in the midst of the civil rights movement in the 1960s, Here's what I would have done. And you may have your own versions of this. Now, we were kids, right? We had all kinds of ideas about what we would or wouldn't do. We didn't understand, right, legal white supremacy. We didn't grow up under that. And we, it was choice, we didn't understand choice was choices. But that question has always haunted me, right? What would I have done? in the midst of the civil rights movement. So I wanna tell all the young people in the room, you don't have to wonder that anymore, right? The truth is that whatever it is you would have done in the midst of the civil rights movement is likely going to be what you do when you walk out of this door today. The first thing you should do when you walk out of this door today is join an organization that works on an issue you believe in. Whether it is climate, whether it is immigrant refugee issues, whether it is anti-Semitism, police abuse, be an organization. If you aren't an organization, there's not likely, sadly, much you can do. But if you are in organization and in communities, you can shift things that happen in your community, you can bring your voice to a national level, and you can start to practice, right? What does an inclusive America look like? So what I'm gonna do is take two questions and then let Eric answer both and then we get to go eat. Um, so, let's see, students? There's the, yeah, he's passing the microphone. Oh, oh, oh okay. You can ask me after. Thank you. Oh. Hi, my name is Chris. Um, first, thank you for the very enlightening talk. That was fantastic. Secondly, um, I wanted to ask, you talk about America's institutions being based on white supremacy and ideas of disparity. Uh, does that make the mainstream more vulnerable to white national ideals? And if so, how can we start changing institutions to more effectively support contemporary democracy outside of those white supremacy de facto laws? And we'll take one more question and then let, let Eric answer. Another student? Okay, down in front. You can race. Uh, so earlier you mentioned that um, if Donald Trump loses this next election or if he is successfully impeached and removed from office, um, that there will be this sort of um, white nationalist backlash. Um, my question is that uh, what should we do about it? Because obviously it isn't worth it to let him win the next election or to call off the impeachment inquiry because there's too much at stake to let him remain in power, which means that inevitably we will have this white nationalist backlash. Um, so how do you suggest we go about sort of addressing it and making sure that it is the least destructive that it can be? So 
here's what I would say. Can, can, can I, I'm going to give you the straight answer from me, right? In my dream, what you all do is you walk out of this, you walk out of this event today, you find that organization and you join it, right? The second thing that you do, because I think this is, it's funny that I'm going here, and if you knew me, Ken knows me, so he'll find this shocking that this is about to come out of my mouth. But what I hope happens is that everyone who can run for office, as soon as you can run for local office, that you actually run for local office. And I don't care if it's the water board, I don't care if it's the dog catcher, I don't care if it's the school board, I don't care if it's the mayor, I don't actually care even if you win or lose. I hope you all run for office because you actually are closer to the idea of a real multiracial, multireligious, inclusive America than even my generation. And what, you, what we need right now is the space to practice what that inclusive democracy looks like. And we're not going to be able to practice that until young people start stepping up, right? In the same way that you are stepping up for climate justice right now, right? Challenging white nationalism, challenging forms of racism is also about bringing justice into the climates that we live in. And so the one thing I would, I would just say here and back is no, we should not stop the impeachment process. The rule of law is critical to a democracy. I, I will say it up here. The person who's president now, I hope, is not the president. Um, I think he will be, so I'll just predict that right now. But I hope that he's not. Um, and what we can do in the meantime is to model what it means to build community and put real power behind it. And the way we put real power are two ways. Bringing people together and putting ourselves in positions of leadership. And leading in government, I know it sounds really boring, would probably be more exciting if you all were running for office. So that's what I hope happens. Thank you, Eric. Thank you all. And now, time for lunch. Have a good lunch. And Roger's going to... Lunch is going to be served. There's going to be two breakout sessions that are going to be starting in about 15 minutes. Uh, two breakout sessions starting in about 15 minutes. One in Olin 203.